we bring our gifts together before the Lord. Recognizing that what we have isn't our most extravagant. Is in the grand scheme of things pretty humble. But we bring the gifts because we know the greatest gift we have is Jesus Christ. And that when we bring our gifts as humble as they may be before him, he can do great things with them. Last week we talked about Jesus turning water into wine. Yesterday in the service for Annie West, I, I talked about the loaves and the fishes feeding thousands and having leftovers. We bring our gifts because we know that whatever we have, given with a glad and cheerful heart, given with, with good intention, uh, not given out of obligation, out of duress, out of uh, an attempt to bribe God in some way, that when we bring our simple gifts with pure hearts, he uses them to do great things. So with that in mind, we dedicate on ourselves and these arguments. Holy God, receive these gifts. Receive what we offer up in our hearts. Receive what we commit before you. Receive what we have uh, given financially and how we share our time and how even our mindset and our, our willingness to see the world through your eyes. May these all be gifts that you can use to help us reach others for you, to continue to share your name, to draw others to who you are that they might know the joy that we've known, and to continue on a path of discipleship. Continue, oh Father, to use these gifts. Use them as we give them individually. Use them as we transform them as a church. Use them as we you distribute these gifts out here within these walls and, and just outside in our local streets. And use these gifts around the world. We offer them up in keeping with the, the joy that we receive in Jesus Christ. With that same enthusiasm, we bring these gifts and say, Use me, O Lord. This is our prayer in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. <clears throat> our offertory hymn, if you will, uh, is Tell Me the Old, Old Story. Last week I talked a little bit about I love the hymns that are about the story. And this is another one right in that same little section in our hymnal. Uh, but tell me the old, old story. Now, a challenge for me in getting music and putting it in our worship packet and sharing with you um, is that I try to find stuff that's generally in our hymnal. Um, but our hymnal has unique arrangements. <clears throat> and our hymnal does not include the third verse that's in your worship packet. So if you're using the worship packet instead of the hymnal, the hymnal has three verses, just sing those three. If you're using the worship packet, we're singing one, two, and four. Um, and normally I would even kind of do an extra emphasis on verse four as I sing it, as, as poorly as that might be, just to help you go, oh, that's right, one verse four. I'm not going to be able to get the voice to do that today. So if you end up singing the wrong verse, you're probably sitting there you know, with, with just you and your family. Um, and you all sing the wrong verse together, and that is okay. We're going to have a similar situation when we uh, have our, our final hymn <coughs> of the day. But uh, tell me the old, old story um, of Jesus and his love. Verses 1, 2, and 4. <laughs>
guessing that many of you grew up with that hymn. I know that I certainly did. Um, and there's a comfort in the hymn. But every couplet in that hymn is just so powerful when we stop and think about it. Um, I, every time we sing it, when that first verse, we're on that second couplet. Uh, tell me the story simply, as to a little child, for I am weak and weary and helpless and defiled. And I hear that, and I think it's that word weak that pulls me back to that song you learned as a child, Jesus loves me, this I know. He is weak, I'm strong. Sometimes that's just the simple story we need. In considering recent days, the last couplet, the last phrasing about, and when that world's glory is dawning. Now that world's glory is talking about the world yet to come because the couple right before it was telling me the same old story. When you have cause to view this world's empty glory is constantly to, hey, if I need to get a rattle my cage a little bit, if I need you to kind of Remind me to whom I belong because the world's glory is calling on me. Tell me the story. And when the glory that is yet to come is dawning, tell me the old, old story. Christ Jesus makes me whole. In recent days, we've heard the names of men who have been made whole in Jesus in a dawning glory on the other side. And we need to hear that story. It's a powerful word. So when we're weak as children, and when we're at death's door, tell me the story. And that's what we do together as a church. We tell the story. Sometimes it's told from the pulpit, sometimes in a vacation Bible school or Sunday school class or a Bible study. But most often when we tell the story, it's through the lives we live. We tell the story as we go about it. We don't tell it just in these walls. We tell it as we go about our daily lives. It becomes the testimony that we live that shows to whom we belong. And so even as we bring our prayers together, we recognize that we don't just bring the prayer in church. We, we become a people of prayer. And we allow that prayer to flow out in how we interact with people. <clears throat> All right, today we shared several names, and then perhaps you <clears throat> had things in an email or a text message this week where you've, you've passed on some names and some things to pray for. And hopefully you've prayed with people. You've engaged them with the story of Jesus, the story of hope, the story of strength, the story about a dawning glory on the other side. It was interesting yesterday, I received a text that, that my aunt, who we've been praying for, had passed. And my brother in the text said, there is no morning here, because there's a new morning where she is. See different morning words. But that idea that the new glory has dawned for her. Also, in that same text message, is my one sister put a, a, a remark about the woman who hugged her at the grocery store as she was crying, as she received the news. That testimony of, of connecting. The old story. And because we know that story, we bring these prayers. And so we pray for those from our church family that we've lost in recent days. And we pray for those that we know have been um, sick and, and even uh, hospitalized. And we lift these things. Those who have undergone uh, testing of a variety of, of medical, medical testing, um, those who are recovering from medical procedures, we bring these things. And it's part of our story. That Jesus is with us. And when we are weak, we have his strength. When we're worn out, we have his spirit to fill us up. To fill our sails as we continue uh, our journey together. 
And so we bring these things and we pray for one another. And this is part of our story. Let's lift these things in prayer. Holy God, we thank you. We thank you for who you are and what you've done. We thank you for the promise of eternal life on the other shore. We thank you that you are with us during this time. And we get a, we get a glimpse, we get a taste, we, we begin to understand. And there will come a time when we will, will know fully. But we know of your love for us. We know of salvation in the name of Jesus. We know that you are one who healed and who touched and who invaded lives with love. And so we bring before you our prayer list and those names on it. Those who are, are worried. Those who are weary. Those who are grieved. Those who are, are struggling to make decisions and those who are just wondering when will healing come. For those who are dealing with work situations. For those of us who get frustrated, angry, and sometimes withdrawn when we read the headlines. Or we hear the new story coming over our radios. Father, encourage us in those dark moments. Remind us that we know the light and are called to share the light. That we are called to spread the light of Jesus' life. We know. We know that we live in a dark world. But we have known the light. Allow us to continue to tell the old, old story of Jesus and his love. This is our prayer as we are together in the name of Jesus. Amen. We continue in this season of epiphany, the season of revelation and understanding. I, in my mind, think of it, aha moments. And we tell stories, an old, old story, stories that we've heard before, but we find new hope, new meaning. We find little shadows of things that we've never noticed before. And we recognize that, that shadows are about textures. Now, some of you know that I, I it's kind of weird. I enjoy our historic cemetery. And I enjoy reading some of the stones. And uh, some of the oldest stones are the most eroded. Um, and they're, they're very hard to see. And perhaps you've actually joined us on one of our flashlight tours. And if you've done that, you, you've understood something that almost is counterintuitive. That we can actually see the stones better than that. Because we can take a light and shine the light across the stone. And if you take a dark night and a bright flashlight and shine it across the stone, anywhere that there's little indentations is now a shadow forms. In the bright light, when the light is shining on the, or somebody takes the flashlight and shines it on the front, but in the, in the bright light of day, there's not enough distinction and it looks like the stone is blank. But that light sweeping across it puts shadows in places that you would not have recognized. And we can actually read things at night that we can't read at day. And I think that's kind of true when we read scripture that we're familiar with. We're, we're kind of used to seeing it with the light in a certain way and our understanding, our interpretation of it comes that way. But sometimes if we come at it from a little bit different angle, there's a shadow that forms that tells us there's something else there. And so we read familiar stories and we tell the old, old story. But we hear it with new ears each time. And so I'm going to guess that a lot of you that this passage that we're going to read from the Gospel of Luke is an old story that you've heard before, but maybe today we'll find a little different texture in it. Now, this takes place in that season of Epiphany when Jesus is being revealed. This takes place after baptism, after um, temptation. 
And we have Jesus returning to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. And news about him spread through the whole countryside. He was teaching in their synagogues, and everyone praised him. Now, we recognize that covers a lot of ground. Um, and Luke's purpose wasn't to go into detail about those things, but he wanted to set the stage for what was happening. Jesus is back in, in his neck of the woods, and he's going around and he's begun his teaching ministry. He's begun to connect, and people are recognizing something about him. Um, we probably shouldn't read too much into everyone praised him. Um, we probably shouldn't read that, that everybody recognized him as Lord and Messiah, and they were praising him in that way. But perhaps more in the idea that he was kind of a rising star. Uh, and people were beginning to say, there's something about this guy. So Luke lays that out for us. When we pick up verse 16, he went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. Now, we don't want to discard that phrase too easily. He's kind of worked his way home, and on the way he's been building a reputation. And the time has come where he's back in what is likely the synagogue that he went to as a child. The synagogue that he attended with his family. Where he was perhaps most known. And he comes back. And on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. Now, I'm going to, this is just my interpretation, I have no way of knowing this for sure. So, take that for what it's worth. I'm going to say that it was his custom when he was growing up to go to the synagogue on the Sabbath. And that's certainly part of his routine, his tradition, his, his personal culture is to be there on the Sabbath. But I'm going to say that based on what we read in verse 15, he was teaching in their synagogues and everyone praised him, that it, it was also his custom to go to synagogues as the teacher. And here these two things are being blended together. He's in his hometown, in his home synagogue, in the place where people were used to him being, but he's coming with a slightly different custom. He's coming now as a teacher, as a rabbi, as one whose words are given weight. I, I wonder what he was feeling in that moment. I wonder if as he came in there, he saw new faces. I don't know if you've ever gone home somewhere. And the crowd has changed a little bit. And there are new faces. I'm wondering if he saw some of those old faces that he was expecting to see. I'm wondering if he saw maybe the older fellow that used to scold him when he was young for being a little too boisterous as they were gathering. Or maybe he saw someone who used to give him kind of the side eye when he Maybe in some of the discussions, challenge the teaching that he didn't know his place. I wonder if he saw those folks, and I wonder if he, as he gathered there, as was his custom, as he's weighing my custom as a child and now my custom as a rabbi, if he wondered, what are they going to think about me? What's the response going to be? I'm going to guess that for many of us, We'd rather just sit back and be quiet. But his custom was to teach in the synagogues. He stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written. Some people who were hearing of, hey, you know this Jesus kid? You know, 
He's teaching. He's getting a pretty good reputation. He's like, I wonder what he's going to say. And I wonder if others are going to say, man, I know this kid. Good luck. I wonder if there was a dramatic pause as he was getting that scripture. They wonder, what is he going to say? I wonder if some are waiting to eat. This guy of the name, he can share with us. He found the place where he's great. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free. To proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. This is an old story that we've told before. You're familiar with it. Well, that... That text that he read from Isaiah. For the people gathered in that synagogue, that was an old story. They had heard it. They would heard it multiple times. And they heard multiple rabbis expound on it. And multiple rabbis talked to them about it. They knew about this good news to the poor, this freedom from the prisoners and recovery of the land and set the oppressed free. They knew that was from that prophecy of Isaiah. And what's this Jesus, Joshua, what's he going to tell us? about this, about proclaiming the year of the Lord's favor, or the translation that perhaps you're reading, the one that I grew up with, the year of Jubilee. What's he going to say? Every eye is on him as he has sat back down. And the rabbi would sit down and teach. He would stand up to read the word of God, but then sit down for the teaching. And he began by saying to them, today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. I wonder what came next. I mean, that, uh, next week we're going to read about what came next. But what came next in that, in that immediate next? Were there people that had a smile on their face and ah, ah, or were there gasps? Or more likely with a lot of, uh, what? See, they've heard this passage time and time again, with the emphasis being on the good news and proclaiming freedom and sight and setting the oppressed free and the year of Jubilee. But it seems like, as Jesus says, today the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing, that there was a more emphasis on, he has anointed me, and he has sent me. Which is some pretty bold statements. You and I, because this for us is an old, old story, we know the truth of it. That in fact, Jesus is the Messiah. He is the anointed one. He is the one sent with the message. He is the evangel. And he's come to proclaim good news to the poor, to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, the year of Jubilee. That's a lot. That's a lot. There's some major things in there. And for the people of that hometown synagogue to hear Jesus saying that the he is just really him. That that kid that grew up here, he's the one that God has anointed. And today the scripture is fulfilled. This, this scripture has been part of our prophecy, part of our scripture for centuries. He Today is saying it's fulfilled. And let's face it, there, there are some very practical reasons to question that. Who is the blind?
blind that he's making to see? Who are the prisoners that he's setting free? Who are the oppressed that are being free? And this isn't a year of jubilee. I think that might be the most polite one. See, a jubilee would be every 50 years. And, uh, and, and again, you've probably heard some of this. That there were things that happened, debts that were absolved, uh, real estate deals that were kind of undone. That, that in that year of jubilee, it was a year of forgiveness, of, of cleaning the slate. And it was part of the Hebrew culture, but it wasn't necessarily practiced. It was one of those things that God had said, but now nah, we don't really, he didn't really mean it like that. We really wouldn't wipe out somebody's debt. Now maybe a 50-year-old, a 49-year-old debt, hey, after 50 years you wipe it out. But hey, not that debt from two years ago. That, that's, that's still too, too much. No, we're not, we're not wiping that out. And so the year of Jubilee really didn't so much. It's kind of like some of those things that become ceremonial holidays for us. And we talk about them in name, but we don't really live them. Not unlike perhaps some of your neighbors who by no means would ever claim Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, but celebrate Christmas or Easter. Jubilee was kind of like that. It was kind of a a nice idea, a thought, but Jesus is proclaiming that, and it's not the 50th year. Can he really do that? Oh, I'm going to say yes. They didn't know, they didn't understand. And then even that most blatant of them, that year of Jubilee, the year of the Lord's favor, they didn't understand what that meant. See, I think that a lot of the things, and this isn't just my thinking, this is what I've been taught, that a lot of the things that take place in the scripture are meant to be a glimpse for us. They're meant to be walking in the house and smelling the roast beef, and it's smelling it already beginning to taste it. You know what's roast beef. You know what it's going to be like, but you haven't sat down and eaten it yet. Or to smell the apple pie or snickerdoodle cookies. And begin to have your mouth water. I think a lot of the things in the Old Testament were meant to give us a, an aroma of, a taste of what was yet to come. And a year of jubilee. When things are made right, where debts are canceled, prisoners are set free, those who had indentured themselves as servants receive their freedom. We're meant to give it just a, a hint of, a taste of what will really come when God's year of Jubilee comes, when the year of His favor comes. The, Setting someone free. It's just a glimpse of how we're freed from our sin. When letting a prisoner out, a prisoner who presumably was guilty of something and was justly charged and justly tried and justly sentenced and justly serving that sentence is now set free from the prison. Is just a hint of what we have when Jesus sets us free from our sin. And the blind, who can now see the physical world around them, what a miracle that would be. But what a cheap reflection of how our eyes are open in Jesus to a world that's beyond the physical world. And the good news, good news proclaimed to the poor, I mean, that could be that there's going to be a, a government subsidy check coming your way. Or that there's going to be some sort of relief or some sort of uh, assistance provided. And that's good news. And we, we understand what that must be like. But to recognize the poor in spirit that had the good news beyond this, 
that there is hope beyond what you are experiencing, <clears throat> that's what Jesus is talking about. I'm here to tell you that it is beginning now. I'm proclaiming it in God's name. And you might not understand. But that taste, this is on the tip of your tongue, that you, you smell that Thanksgiving meal and you've been getting all ready. The taste, we're going to sit down for that meal. That's what Jesus is proclaiming. And I believe that that day, not every chain literally broke and every prisoner was set free. I believe that that day not every person who was blind literally all of a sudden was seeing. Because those things are just of this world. They're just that aroma wafting as we come through the door. But Jesus was talking about something so much bigger, so much beyond. And I have a feeling that no one in that synagogue, whether they were anticipating and ready to encourage and they were ready to cheer on what he had to say, or if they had already made up his mind that he had nothing good to say, I don't think anybody, when he said, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing, understood what he was talking about. And frankly, even right now, even with what I said, I don't think I truly understand. into and I anticipate and I'm already salivating of what's waiting for me. This idea of today it begins. Today it begins. Today the world is still the world. The challenges are still the challenges. The bills that I have to pay the work that must be done still exists, but I today begin to hear Jesus say, but there comes another glory. There comes another dawn. There is something else, and today I invite you into it. And I can start to be a part of that. In 1972, a singer by the name of Johnny Nash. And, and for some of you, this is going to be in your wheelhouse. Others of you are going to have absolutely no idea who I'm talking about. He had a number one hit on the Billboard Hot 100. It was the first reggae tune to ever hit number one. I can see clearly now. I can see clearly now the rain is gone. I can see all obstacles in my way. Gone are the dark clouds that had me blind. It's going to be a bright, bright, sunshiny day. Ah, that's upbeat, positive stuff. That's an encouragement. Even on a cloudy day, you can sing that and say, but you know what, I see beyond these clouds. I know beyond this. It might actually be a day where it's raining, and that song could come on the radio to me if you have that in the radio to station plays the hits of the 60s, 70s, and 80s, or something like that, and you can sing along with it even while it's raining, because you understand the hope that's in that. That's the hope of this message. Good news to the poor. You might still be poor, but know that there is good news. You might still be a prisoner. You might still be actually paying your debt to society, but there is a freedom in Christ. Jesus read from Isaiah the recovery of sight for the blind. I can see clearly now. Gone are the dark clouds that had me blind. I can see it. I can see it. Jesus, I hear you. I can see it. I think I can make it now. The pain is gone. All of the bad feelings have disappeared. Here is the rainbow I've been praying for. It's going to be a bright, bright, sunshiny day. 
Now, Johnny Nash, who sang that, he had some other songs that came. That was his first really big hit. He had some other stuff that was out there, but he later, a couple years later, sang Cecilia and Mother and Child Reunion. So he had a lot going on there in the 70s. And, um, and then there, there's a whole generation that had no idea of that from the 70s that in 1993, the movie Cool Runnings came out. And there was a, a re-release of that song, and it climbed the charts. It made the top 20. And a whole other generation began to hear, I can see clearly now, the rain is gone. I was looking up some stuff about this, and what I found the most interesting, the one that talks about, when the song says, I can see clearly now, the rain is gone, I can see all obstacles in the way, gone in the dark clouds that had me blind. It's going to be a bright, bright, sunshiny day. Ray Charles sang that song. He recorded it. Now, did he sing that like he could actually see things physically in the physical world? No. But it's an understanding that we see things beyond the physical world. We have an understanding and comprehension a light in our darkness. I think when Jesus proclaims that day, and not everybody gets back the land in the year of Jubilee, not everybody gets back the land that had been in their family, but had somehow, through one means or another, they had lost. Does that mean Jesus was wrong? No. No more than Ray Charles was lying when he said, I can see, when he sang, I can see too. And today, you might not be feeling it. So today, you might say, no, it is a dark day, and there are clouds, and there's, there's rainstorms in my life. And Jesus is in me. There's rainbows and sunshine. In me, it's a bright day. In me, there is a freedom. And that's why even, like at a funeral that was held here in this, in this sanctuary yesterday, even in a time of loss and experience and grief, there can be joy in knowing Jesus, in knowing the freedom that he has given, in knowing that the dark day here is a bright, sunny day. I think Jesus was inviting people in that synagogue to within see clearly now. I invite you, perhaps today is the day that the dark clouds come on, and you will see clearly in Jesus. Let's pray here. Holy God, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to read an old story and see a new texture, a new shadow in it. To have the light come in in a different way and reveal to us another facet of your eternal truth. Thank you. Thank you. For freedom, for sight, for good news.
Read the fourth verse. Sing the fourth verse later on today. Read through it later on. Read it prayerfully. But for now, using the hymn book, verses 1, 2, and 3, just the first three verses, using the worship packet as printed. Open my eyes that I may see. in 